fear of dying. A lot of people probably expect that that to be right up at the very top of the list of phobias that, that we have. Actually, there is a, an answer to that question, though, that is very appropriate. What do people fear more than the fear of dying? And the answer to that question is, people fear flying in an airplane at 35,000 feet while doing public speaking in the dark. That's the, that's the answer to that question, because you see in a list of phobias, uh, the fear of dying uh, comes down pretty low in that list, about fifth or sixth, and the, the things before it are in fact the fear of flying, the fear of public speaking, the fear of heights, and the fear of the dark. So, it would be then the fear of flying in an airplane at 35,000 feet while doing public speaking in the dark. It's actually not the fear of flying that people have, it's the fear of crashing. You understand that. It's probably not the fear of public speaking that people have, it's the fear of getting up here and saying that your toe can't touch your foot or something like that, you know. Um, it's really not the fear of heights that people have, it's the fear that they're going to fall from those heights. And uh, when it comes to the fear of the dark, I mean, you know, most of us are rational individuals, aren't we? We're really not afraid of the dark, we're afraid of what's out there in the dark. But, but most Americans, though, in surveys admit that they struggle with this. Around 60% of Americans, as a matter of fact, when surveyed, admit that they have a fear of the dark. And if you grew up in a house with a basement, you probably had a fear of the dark. I grew up in a house with a basement, and I remember the two times that I've been scared the most, I was down in that basement. Two totally different stories, not even worth me telling right now, but you know, I was afraid of the dark, or afraid of what might be down there in the dark. And so many people can relate to that. No matter what your age, uh, you probably feel a little uncomfortable in the dark. And so I, I think it's appropriate, that being the case, that from a spiritual perspective, sin is compared to darkness. And as you know, righteousness is compared to light. Uh, perhaps the, mess, the, the, the most well-known verse in the Bible about light is this verse, John 8 and verse 12, where, where Jesus proclaimed that I am the light of the world. Uh, the next chapter in the Gospel of John, you probably remember the first few verses tells a story about uh, a blind man. And, and again, it's ironic that after Jesus says in John 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world, that he finds this blind man. Uh, and he relieves him of darkness, and he allows him to see the light. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. So, so what I want us to do tonight, I want us to consider what we ought to do with light. We know how important it is. We know how much we fear the opposite of it. And so I want us to discuss tonight uh, what everyone should do, every action that a person should take toward the light. There are just three things that I want to bring to your attention in the next few minutes. The first thing is, we should search for the light. Every one of us should search for the light. What is our natural reaction to when we are found in darkness? Uh, just take, for instance, you uh, walk into a dark room. What's the first thing you do? Your natural reaction for us today would be to start filling along the wall until you find the light switch. Because we desire light when we're in the presence of darkness. What happens when the electricity goes off? In the, in the middle of a storm, um, you know, most young people today would pull out their you know, phone and look up their flashlight app and turn it on, and that would work for them. You know, uh, some of us older people might, first of all, instinctively look for a flashlight, or we'd go look in the place in the drawer where we knew we kept, we kept the matches, a candle, because we, we want light. We, we search for light when we're in the presence of darkness. And let me suggest to you that the same eagerness that we have for physical light we should have for spiritual light, in our search for spiritual light. And there is no mistaking where that search begins and ends. Jesus said it. He said, I am the light of the world. And so since He is the light of the world, that settles it. That's where we search for light. Now, I want to point out something about this context. Here in John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 12, where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And I want to take you back a chapter earlier, to chapter 7 in the Gospel of John. John. John chapter 7 and verse 2 notes that the events that occur during John chapter 8 were during one of the three major Jewish feasts. 
This one being the Feast of Booths, or as it's often called, the Feast of Tabernacles. During this particular feast, Jews commemorated their living in the wilderness by setting up temporary booths to live in. That's why it was called the Feast of Booths. Of course, you remember that during those days, God provided for the people in a number of ways as they wandered around in the wilderness. Um, That being the case, this feast gave Jesus the, the perfect backdrop for making impressionable statements about Himself. For instance, in John chapter 7, 37 and 38, he said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. You recall that not only did God give them water from the rock in their wanderings, but He also led them by what? He led them by light. And you can see that in Exodus 13, verse 21. Uh, The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. So during the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Jews had a ceremony called the illumination of the temple. Uh, This took place in that part of the temple they called the Court of the Women, where the treasury was. And it was during this ceremony that it is said that there were four great candelabra lit, and those who record this historically say that it lit up the temple in such a way that even the courtyards nearby were lit by these, these great candelabra. Now, remember that it's in John chapter 8, verse 20, that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Where was He at? He was in this exact place where it is said they lit these giant candelabra. The very place where all of that artificial light was being put forth. And it's on that occasion then, in that situation then, where Jesus says to them, I am the light of the world. It's like Jesus was trying to say, you've seen the light from the temple but I am the light of the world. By the way, one of the reasons the Pharisees became so upset with Jesus on this occasion is because they associated light with God. Psalm 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light. Uh, Isaiah 16 verse 19 says, The Lord will be your everlasting light. Micah 7 verse 8 says, When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. So, Jesus knew He was from God. That's why He could say, uh, I am the light of the world. That's why He said in John 8, verse 14, I know where I came from and I know where I am going. Jesus knew that He was from God. Uh, that he, he knew that He had what people needed. He needed uh, they needed the light. He understood that He was the light. He was the way for them to get back to God. And so He wanted them to have a desire to search for light. Before leaving this, you recall there's a great example of this in John the third chapter. A few chapters before John chapter 8, there's a man by the name of Nicodemus who incidentally comes to Jesus during the night. Ironically, we might say he was searching for light. He came to Jesus by night searching for light. And he found him in John the third chapter. And you recall the encounter that he had with Jesus on that occasion Uh, And in those first uh, five or six verses there, uh, we learn about uh, being born again. And uh, you you remember most of that, I am sure, where uh, Jesus said uh, a second time to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 5, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's interesting, though, that it's in this same discourse that Jesus gives that golden text of the Bible. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And it's also interesting, I think, down in verse 19 and 20 and 21, that Jesus said, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light. It does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does 
what is true comes to the light so that he may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out by God. In, in this discourse with Nicodemus, he introduces him to baptism. He also reminds him of the great love that God had for him. And he even at the end brings up the idea of light, searching for the light. And he also recommends that you refrain from the works of darkness, which is what we might call repentance. And so, like in those days, even today, one of the reactions we should have to light is we should search for the light. And that would be, of course, the uh, avoiding the works of darkness. The second thing that I want to bring to your attention, another reaction we should have to light, we should stay in the light. Once we find the light, once we search for the light and find the light, we should stay in the light. Uh, again, in John chapter 8, and verse 12, I am the light of the world. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This verse reminds us of a couple of important principles. We must find the light. That's why we search for it. And then when we find it, we follow it. We find the light, and then we follow the light. After we find the light, Jesus said we follow Him. And it's interesting, according to William Barclay, that this Greek word to follow has a number of different meanings. But what's interesting about it is they all apply to following Jesus. He says that this word... Uh, is often described, used to describe a soldier following a commanding officer. He says it's used to describe a slave accompanying his master. He says it's used to describe the acceptance of a counselor's advice. It's used to describe obedience to the laws of a city or state. And it's also used to describe following a teacher's line of reasoning. So in every one of those ways... To follow Jesus uh, means that we are considering Him as our commander. We are considering Him as our master, our counselor, our lawgiver, our teacher. And we follow Him. We search for Him. We find Him. And then we follow Him. And let us understand the only way we stay in the light of the Lord is to follow Him. This is described for us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, where John writes, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of His Son cleanses us from all sin. That's one of those fascinating and yet beautiful verses in the Bible that, that gives a Christian confidence to know that when we are staying in the light, when we're walking in the light, when we're... As we discussed this morning, when we believe and when we obey, as we continue to follow the Lord faithfully, we walk in the light. It doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes. We will. And yet this is where the, the blood of the Son of God gives the continual cleansing. It's not in the works of darkness, but it's in the light of the Lord. You say, well, what's so important about this point? Well, let me remind you of this principle. The Bible says, uh, the Bible makes it perfectly clear that one can search for Jesus and find Him and yet fail to stay in the light because it's possible to fall away. This is the real danger. And this applies to probably most of us here tonight. We've been fortunate enough. Somebody loved us enough. Somebody cared for us enough to lead us to the light. They perhaps instilled a desire in us to get out of darkness to search for the light. And, and as a result, we've become Christians. But see, the important thing, the reason we're here tonight, the reason you're here tonight, I commend you for being here tonight, it's because you want to stay in the light. It's because you've been told, and it's true, that a person can leave the light, can fall away from the light, can fall away from the truth. And the Bible, of course, supports that line of reasoning. It is possible for one who is saved to fall back into darkness. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Therefore let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 6, In giving the qualifications for our elders, it says he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. That verse really says something about the delicate nature 
of a newborn baby in Christ. One of the reasons a, a man who's going to serve as an elder can't be a new convert is because it's apparently a lot more of a high risk for that one to fall into the condemnation of the devil. And that's why we need to pay particular attention to new converts. But the idea, though, is one can be saved and then they can fall. Hebrews 3 and verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving spirit or heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And then 2 Peter 3 and verse 17, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the era of the wicked. And so that's why this is important. It's important for us to discuss this because it's one thing to search for the light, to find the light, to obey the gospel, to be saved, but then we have to continually be diligent and steadfast to stay in the light. Third thing that we should do with the light, that is we should shine the light. The Bible reminds us it's our responsibility, not just for ourselves, but especially for the benefit of those around us, for us to shine the light. Therefore, when we've searched for the light, when we've found it, when we've gained our salvation, when we've been diligent and faithful to stay in the light, we start sharing the light. We want others around us to know the beautiful blessing of finding the Lord and being in the light. You know the classic verse that reminds us of this, comes from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. You are the light of the world. He's talking to His disciples. Those who follow Jesus are lights. We, He says, are like the light of the world. We're like a city set on a hill. It cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, he says, verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who's in heaven. You are to be a shining light. All of us as Christians are to be a city set on a hill. We're like a light put up on a lampstand. And people are supposed to see that light. And they're not supposed to say, oh, what a great person you are. If they say that, then there's something wrong with our lives. They instead are supposed to say, oh, what a great God God is. Because when they see us shining as a light for God, they are going to glorify the Father who's in heaven. On top of our influence, we also can shine our light by teaching. It's one thing to be a, a great influence. And everybody, no matter what their maturity level as a Christian, can take that on themselves to always try to be a good influence to everybody around. Always do right in front of others. It means so much when people see Christians doing the right thing. And it's so disheartening to the church when we know of Christians who are not doing the right thing, who are not being the right example. And it's so harmful out there to the world when they see us not doing the right thing. Because that just gives them ammunition. It's an excuse is all it is, but nonetheless, it, it gives them ammunition for saying, see, that's how those people up there at that church, that's how they really are. They're not genuine. They're not sincere. They're hypocrites. And so we shine our light by being a good example, but we also shine the light with our teaching. In Romans chapter 2, verse 19, Paul told the Jews that they were supposed to be a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. And then 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 says, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. This is why. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says it there. Peter says that we are to proclaim that's one of the ways that we shine the light. We proclaim Jesus and what He can do for others. Our children sometimes sing, this little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'd embarrass every one of us if I asked you to sing that right now. I'm not going to do that. But the point is, each one of us need to be doing that with our lives. We need to be shining. We need to be a light. We need to shine it. Don't cover it up. Don't allow our influence to, to make it go out. And certainly don't 
allow any of the, the works of the devil to cause our light to go out. And not only our influence, not only through our influence do we shine the light, but through our teaching we shine the light. Many a proud man has said, I'm not afraid of the dark. If I asked these teenage boys, they'd say, I'm not afraid of the dark. Most people here tonight would struggle even to admit they're afraid of the dark. But I would submit to you that we need to be afraid of the dark. We need to be afraid of the dark because it represents unrighteousness. It represents the works of the devil. It, it, it represents the activities of those who aren't seeking to fulfill the will of God in their lives. And so, what do we do with the dark? We try to get out of it. We try to turn the light on. And as we have uh, reviewed tonight, what, what we do is we search for the light. We stay in the light, and we shine the light. could be that you're here tonight, and you've never gotten into the light. It's, if you're in a dark room, what do you do? We've already talked about it. You find the light switch. You turn it on. You seek light. None of us like darkness. It bothers us. It's disconcerting. And yet, if you're not a child of God, you're spiritually in the dark. Search for the light. Find the light. We present Him to you tonight. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you'll come to Him, He can change things for you. He, he wants you to believe in Him. He wants you to change your ways, to repent of your sins. He wants you to confess His name before others. It's one of the ways you can shine the light. He wants you to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And in doing that, you find the light and you can stay in the light. And then you can start shining the light. Perhaps you're here this evening and you, you find yourself not being the Christian light that you've sung about since Vacation Bible School and you know something's happened, the light's been blown out. You have not lived in a way to shine the light. You haven't been the influence, you haven't been the teacher, you haven't been the person that shows Christ to others. If that's the case, and you know that you need to make some changes, we want to give you that opportunity as well. If anyone needs to respond to the invitation, we want to extend it right now, and together we stand and as we sing. Thank you.